Welcome everybody to the first semester of, or the first, the first seminar of our semester. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Smita Krishnaswamy. She's a professor of genetics and computer science at Yale. She's also affiliated with several programs, including Applied Math, Biomedical Data Science, the Cancer Center, the Program of in Interdisciplinary Neuroscience. She also got her PhD at University of Michigan in EECS, so it's a fun connection for anyone keeping score. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just hand it over. Um, take us away. Uh, all right, we'll do. I'm um, just going to share my desktop. Let me know if you can't hear me, and I will warn you that there might eventually be some noise here because my kids are coming home from school soon. Um, and can everyone see this? Yep, looks good. Oh, okay, yeah. And I just wanna thank uh, Jean and everyone from Biosets who invited me again. I also got my, one of my undergrad degrees from Michigan. So of course I, I like Michigan and wish I could be there in person, but um, we'll, we'll save that for next time. Um, so today I'm, I actually decided to give sort of an overview of the work we do in my lab. So you can kind of get an idea of the flavor of the stuff that we do um, and, and you know maybe potential uh, intersections or interests of these concepts in, in, in your own research, of which I know there's a wide variety in your department. Um, so my lab um, works on primarily learning representations and unsupervised analysis of structure and patterns uh, for data that's collected uh, usually biologically or biomedically for solving a particular biomedical problem or biological problem. And we tend to address um, the kinds of patterns that we can detect from pretty big biomedical data. And what I mean by big data is that there um, tend to be a lot of observations in this kind of data. Um, as evidenced, for example, uh, from single, some of my single cell sequencing work. So in single cell RNA sequencing, your observations are the cells and you're getting an idea of what the transcriptional program is in each and every single cell. And there can be thousands to even millions of cells that are sometimes measured. Um, other examples that are non-single cellular are things like fMRI data where the units are voxels or patient data. Uh, where you can have uh, different sorts of measurements conducted on the same patient. Um, in our lab, we do address challenges that are common to any of this kind of data. Um, and some of the key challenges that we've worked on addressing, um, some of which I'll talk about, um, are denoising data, which I don't, won't directly talk about, um, understanding what the structure of the data is, uh, despite its high dimensionality and relative complexity, such that you can kind of understand what, where you can go from there and, and what sort of sort of patterns can you quantify. Um, the, the fact that there are multiple samples these days. So for example, in one of the problems I'll be talking about, we have single cell data from over 200 patients. So it's not only one complicated data set, but a whole host of complicated data sets. Um, and this problem of learning dynamics from a lot of this kind of data, which tends to be static. So usually when you measure cells in these modalities, they're destructive measurements and you're not following them along in time. And yet the biological entities that they're measuring are dynamic entities and you want to get some idea of the dynamics. Uh, of these, I'll be talking about um, comparing samples, distilling structure, both at single and multiple resolution using um, manifold learning techniques and understanding uh, dynamics from a new kind of neural network that we're pretty excited about. So a common theme in uh, some of the work in my lab uh, that has helped us to address these challenges is the idea that even though the data can be measured in high dimensional space ambiently in the measurement space, that it actually intrinsically lies on a much lower dimensional manifold that has much more restrictive structure. And the idea is if you can learn the geometry 
or sort of the topology or the shape of this uh, lower dimensional manifold, then you can do a lot of things uh, downstream to gain insight from it. So um, just to give you an example of a test that I'm not talking about much today, let's say you had noise that was uh, splaying data off this manifold. But if you could clearly see that the trend of the data was like this, you can restore the data back to the manifold and, and therefore denoise it. So that's the idea that you first learn the structure of the shape or shape of the data, and then a lot of the downstream tasks become, become a lot easier. So how do we do, how do we learn these sort of data intrinsic, you know, whether they're metric spaces or, or shapes? Um, there are two main methods that we use in my lab to learn that. Um, the first one, uh, first set of methods are uh, graph diffusion methods. So these are extensions of graph spectral methods that use this concept of data diffusion. Um, so the idea is you first render your data into a graph. So you could have data, uh, you could have high dimensional data. In this example, the data is in, in two dimensions. And you can create a graph out of the data by weighting uh, the edges between pairs of data points by the distance using some kind of distance that you like. Usually the, kind, usually the distance is quite simple. It's like Euclidean distance. Then um, what, in order to um, really hone in on what are the major kind of pads in this graph, you'll want to prune this graph so that the more prominent edges are more prominently shown. And that's done by converting from this distance to an affinity matrix. So to convert from distance to affinity, which gives you a weighted adjacency matrix, uh, you usually use a nonlinear kernel that has a drop-off characteristic like this. So you're really emphasizing the close connections much more than the distant ones. And if you follow the close connections along, you can kind of see that you can um, take a walk along the shape of the data. And this idea that you can take a walk through the intrinsic space of the data and learn what these dimensions are is mathematically expressed as diffusion on the graph. Diffusion on the graph refers to the idea of taking a random walk on the graph. A lot of our methods, you don't actually have to randomly walk on the a graph so much as computing the probabilities that you could reach a vertex starting from another vertex, but if you took a random walk. Um, so the idea for this is that you have these affinities that you computed here that, that originally came from distances, but you can um, normalize them into a probability distribution. And this probability distribution will define how you walk. So you would walk towards edges with higher probabilities uh, more often than edges that show lower probabilities. And um, so the this defines a uh, row, row stochastic uh, matrix and um, eigenvectors of this matrix will define the intrinsic dimensions of your data. And this is sort of the theory that came out of what are called diffusion maps, uh, which were invented about 15 years ago by, by my colleague, Rafi Koifman and, and his students actually. And these are the eigenvectors of the um, stochastic uh, Markov matrix uh, that we converted the affinity matrix to. So affinity matrix to a Markov matrix. Um, and these give you um, sort of your coiled dimensions in your data that are really following the shape along of the data. Um, that is one scaffold for learning something about the shape of the data. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit more about how to visualize it and represent it as the talk goes along. The other idea is to use an unsupervised neural network like an autoencoder that is forced to learn a meaningful representation in this layer. And in particular, there's a lot of work in my lab that imposes structure on this layer. And I kind of think of that as a little bit of a statistical sort of thing. In statistics, I think you guys often use models of the data that you're learning the parameters of. So now we're not quite as specific as learning a specific model, but we certainly have experimented with using many kinds of structure in, this, in these layers, whether it's cluster structure or graph spectral structure in, in these. And I'll be talking less about the, this kind of project um, today just based on the random assortment of projects that I chose to cover. Um, so um, one of the first um, 
first challenges that we wanted to address are if you have a large data set you collected on a system on which there is very little known knowledge, uh, one of the things you might immediately want to do is you might want to visualize what the structure in the data is. Um, and then that will also add meaning to uh, what, for example, your diffusion components or the eigenvectors of your diffusion map are. We'll, we'll see that in a, in a second. Um, the issue is that um, it's very difficult to look at big data and actually intuitively understand it unless it's presented to us in a form that humans naturally process. Uh, and one of the forms that we naturally process is two to three dimensional visualizations. So if you uh, have a whole bunch of biaxial plots, you're not going to process them. Uh, heat maps might show certain kinds of cluster structure, but it's very, very difficult to tell more, more difficult um, structure there. Um, and in particular, what we saw happening in the field was there, was, there started to be a really big reliance on uh, dimensionality reduction methods uh, that reduce data down to two dimensions. But um, when you're reducing so much, if you're reducing from 20,000 to 2,000, two dimensions, you have to be aware that you're losing most of the information in your data. So this is kind of like that actually Indian parable I found out where you were there, these blind men looking at elephants, you're seeing different aspects of them. And you see these visualizations are all showing different aspects of this data. And so uh, we in particular saw that the existing methods that were very popular or prevalent um, were showing definitely specific aspects of the data and in particular maybe some not showing some of the aspects that you might also be interested in. So the one, one of the first things I say maybe not necessarily to this crowd but if I was speaking to like a biology crowd is you know try if you really want to visualize your data in 2D try many different methods um, because every method is losing so much information. So let me give you an example. So this is an artificial tree example. So we generally generated data that was sampled along this tree with some noise. So there, there's there's noise there and, it, and it's randomly sampled, but you know, along this tree. Um, and so if you do that and you rotate it into a hundred dimensions and you're trying to see if your two-dimensional visualization can catch the structure of this data, uh, this is one of the results that you'd get. And you can try many examples like this. So what is PCA doing? Uh, PCA's uh, projecting your data to some kind of line or plane. So in this dimension, it's projecting to a line that's kind of over here. Imagine standing here and looking at this data. Uh, that's why you see the blue and purple as overlapping. Um, you see the green and light green and dark green as overlapping. You do see this sticking out and this sticking out. And that's kind of what you're seeing. You're seeing like a linear projection of the data from, from each of the angles. Um, and um, that's interesting because you you are getting an idea of the global uh, variance in the data that there's a lot of variance along this dimension. Um, so the global structure usually is uh, more or less okay in PCA, but some of the details of the structure are often not clear. It's kind of blurry, I would say, because it doesn't really have an ability to denoise along nonlinear directions. Um, in TSNE, you're seeing a different kind of aspect of the data. Uh, here, you actually do some of, see some of the branches, but sometimes they're like shattered or split off. And the reason is because TSNE is a stochastic neighbor embedding method. So it's trying to keep neighbors together, but non-neighbors, there is uh, not really an explicit penalty for what you do with non-neighbors in TSNE because of the way KL divergence looks. So if your probability of transitioning P is low, that term kind of goes away. But people have studied the dynamics of TSNE and it turns out what they do with non-neighbors often is massive repulsion. So you get kind of an explosive looking thing which uh, can, can be useful for certain structures, but it is missing something. Um, so what we wanted with FATE in specific that these two weren't giving was kind of a, an idea of the global geometry or scaffold of the data. So uh, we wanted to clearly be able to see the global structure uh, and we wanted it to denoise the data so that 
you know, these kinds of things are clarified, these branches are, because biological data has a lot of noise and these methods aren't um, and showing global structure in, in, in a denoised way. And so um, this is how we achieve that. And then I'll talk about a little bit about some of the steps involved. So we were strongly motivated by diffusion maps uh, because uh, the concept of diffusion uh, does discover a kind of geometry or global geometry in the data. But sort of the problem with diffusion maps is there's this eigen decomposition involved. So it decomposes into orthogonal components. So kind of what that means is that it, it's basically putting each of these trajectories or perhaps clusters into different diffusion dimension. So it's really great at disentangling the different progressions and components of your data, but it's not that good for visualization because you don't want to see 20 different dimensions to describe the 20 trajectories in your data. So basically what we're trying to do is and change the way diffusion, you know, the diffusion geometry rendering works so that we're collecting all that information into two or three dimensions. So the first few steps are similar to a diffusion map with some modifications. The first one is just you take your gene cell by gene data and you turn it into a distance matrix. We often do just use Euclidean distance. Um, and then this step, we do turn it into an affinity, but we're very careful when we turn the data into an affinity. Uh, because there's massive variations in sampling in the data. So it turns out in order to actually mimic a little bit of the density of the data, you have to use an adaptive kernel. This might sound a little paradoxical to you. The reason is because in a diffusion-based process, uh, if you don't use an adaptive kernel, then you will always walk towards dense centers and this will distort the geometry. So if you want undistorted geometry upon which you can lay density, then you actually need an adaptive kernel where you don't walk so often to every density ditch. Um, and so the adaptive kernel and rapid decay kernel turned out to be very vital here. And then now we have this diffusion operator. It has all the diffusion probabilities we want. It's not overly biased by uh, you know, these density ditches as I'm calling them. Um, so now in order to render this so that it's not disentangled into different dimensions, it appears in two dimensional setting, uh, we, we go back to a different kind of distance. So distance to affinity to a different kind of distance. So this distance is actually an information theoretic distance. Um, it's an M divergence between the diffusion probabilities of one cell to every other cell and another cell to every other cell. It's, so it's comparing the context of the cell. It's saying, if you're at this cell, what are all the different diffusion probabilities? And if you're at this cell, what are all the diff different diffusion probabilities? And how are those different? Um, and that's the new distance that's called the potential distance in our, in our paper. Um, and in particular, this distance is interesting to us because um, of these damping factors it's going to make things that are far away matter too, not just things that are near. So this is why it's putting the data, putting the data point in global context. So now that we have these new distance, we embedded with MDS, uh, but we're using metric MDS, which uh, has some routines on top of classic MDS to squeeze everything to do into two dimensions, because this is a distance preservation method and we have a distance here. Um, so just to talk a little bit, so what does the diffusion actually do, just to, just to give you a little bit more of an idea. So if you have a Swiss roll like this, here's a distance matrix. Uh, this distance matrix has these bands that you see. Uh, these bands uh, refer to connections that are cutting across the space of the data. Whereas if you're measuring cells and your cells are mainly existing here, that kind of means that this is the viable state space of your cells. It kind of, it also means that if you had a cell here, it'll probably die because it's not a valid configuration of genes for cells. So this distance that's cutting across kind of the planes of the data is not a meaningful distance in terms of you know, cellular progression. And it's really this distance that you want. So you can't just use distances. You can use affinities, it makes these sort of, it inverts the matrix and it makes this lighter. So the cross connections are fewer, but it doesn't eliminate them. But what diffusion does when you power the Markov matrix is it makes it very relatively unlikely that you'll go here. 
because probabilistically speaking, t-step random walks are all going to occur here. And so it really cleans out these affinities that don't follow the manifold. Um, and it'll make you uh, go with higher probability along the manifold. And this is really what diffusion does. You totally clean the sidebands out. Um, and now uh, the next step after the diffusion, which denoised the data is that you have this new representation of cells uh, in your single cell data or whatever data you have as T-step diffusion probabilities to all other cells. So each cell is represented by a probability distribution. So this is like a statistical manifold. And, and, and we take uh, basically a divergence between those. Um, and, um, and the uh, main idea here is diffusion distance is distance in a diffusion map it's very dominated by your near neighbors and these high probabilities, which is one reason it kind of disentangles the space, but we're making the far away things matter too. And then um, that's one of the reasons why this works, but you don't have to do, use this one. You can use um, any, anything else that you want that's a divergence. You can use um, KL divergence, for example, and we've tried it and it would work. It's just asymmetric. So you, you have to symmetricize it if you're interested in certain things. Um, so um, just to show you that this actually gives you something different than diffusion maps um, or that it's doing this collecting that I'm talking about. Here's another sort of artificial tree data set and fate showing the whole thing but each diffusion dimension only highlighting one branch more or less. This is what it's doing. So if you project it to diffusion one versus diffusion two, imagine all of this stuff would be collected near zero at diffusion one, and this branch would come out at diffusion one, and diffusion two, all of this is collected at zero. So that's kind of what's happening with, that's the difference between the diffusion map. So actually what I really say is, if you have fate, you can actually color it by the diffusion components to look at what the trajectories in your data are. Um, and so here is an example of fate, and here's an example of how you could use it to gain insight in biology. Um, this is a human embryonic stem cell development experiment where you grew the human embryonic stem cells as embryoid bodies, and you're watching them differentiate over a 27-day time course. And uh, now, um, I didn't give the fate embedding any information about what the time points are. I've just simply overlaid the time points on top of them to show you that PCA and fate um, respect the time order in the sense that there's this idea that these human embryonic stem cells are pretty similar to what you get just after them, but they're very different from what you get at 24 days when you have more mature lineages like neuronal and cardiac lineages emerging. Um, but of course, PCA has this blurry quality because it's not like cleaning these areas uh, in, of nonlinearity. Uh, as far as the noise is concerned. Uh, T-SNE, especially if there's uh, sparse areas where you haven't sampled as much, shatters it, it, because it, has, it doesn't have any global distance preservation penalties. And diffusion maps, as I said, on average, two diffusion dimensions shows two trajectories. So it's just showing this one and, and this one. So that's kind of how, so you can further analyze this. If you're a biologist, for example, you can tell which genes are being expressed in which of these lineages, and it kind of gives you a strong intuition. And in fact, my stem cell biologist friend, she um, wants, she actually made us give her like a animation of this where she can color it with different genes to identify different things. And so one way you can think about what uh, fate and the associated diffusion geometry is giving you is uh, a way where you can keep the global structure of the data, but clean the local structure so you see finer grain, grain nonlinear details. And after um, other things that you know, fate might help you decide is they might help you decide the model for your clustering, like how many clusters do you want? Uh, the diffusion geometry operator itself We've used it in the paper for intrinsic local dimensionality estimation, which can pick out branch points and these kinds of things. So this is, this is so it's you know it's a visualization, but it can be useful for you know guiding further analysis and selecting some of the downstream downstream models. And just because some of you are interested in in, in genetics, 
uh, I just thought I'd show, show this, which is it's not a uh, very specific to any data type. You can use it on you know, population data, um, DNA sequencing data, or many other, other kinds of data. And just if you want to see a certain kind of kinds of structure. Um, the question um, so that I sometimes get is, how can you really compare all of these visualizations? Uh, they're, they're doing different things. And that's definitely a hard question in a certain sense because you don't know what people are doing emotionally, cognitively when they're visualizing data. Uh, but you can figure out what they're doing kind of in, in kind of a mathematical sense. And one of the ways is to actually quantify uh, based on ground truth. And one of the metrics we proposed for what we think fate is doing is that it's preserving affinities on a manifold in a denoised way. So what we did to show that is we create these fake data sets from the splatter program that can be pads or groups. We know, simulate it with no noise and measure geodesic distances. Then we embed it um, in whatever 2D and we see what it's doing. And it uh, turns out that our hypothesis was at least you know, mostly correct in that fate's better at uh, preserving this denoise manifold affinity than other other things. You can also measure other things, like it's pretty good at adjusted rand index as well. If you measured the preservation of your first nearest neighbor, it might not be the best, um, That this kind of thing. So there are quantitative ways you can compare this, uh, but that's probably not also the full, full answer. Um, so that's, that's what I wanna emphasize. So um, this hopefully gives you an idea of how you can use diffusion geometry to kind of understand the entire structure of your data. You can also do this in, in 3D or other numbers of dimensions. Um, but uh, one of the aspects that, is was lacking from the first set of analyses that we did in our lab is this recognition that there might not just be one structure in, bi in biomedical data, especially data that's so detailed like single cell data. Um, and there could be many levels of organization and structure that you're interested in. So um, this made us uh, very interested in thinking about um, computational topology. So just a quick intro to maybe people who are not as familiar with topology. So topology is the, a study of characterizing sort of the abstract shape of objects in the data. Um, and in particular, characterizing shapes in a way that doesn't necessarily talk about how far is this point from this point, which I spent a lot of time just, just talking about when I was doing the geometry. So the idea that you know this ball would have you know, the same characterization as a square. Um, and in when they do this kind of characterization, they're often looking at the different kinds of holes in the data, which are quantified by these by these Beatty numbers. Uh, so in Beatty numbers, you uh, B0 is sort of the number of components or points, and then you can have the number of holes or voids and then tunnels. And I don't even know if there are words for um, higher dimensional holes, higher dimensional holes that you basically see. Um, in computational topology, um, topology is actually a combination of geometry and, and regular topology in the sense that you're looking for features that persist uh, regardless of kind of the metric you put on it and you wanna see how long they persist. And that's generally how you characterize the shape uh, in you know, data or topological data analysis. So you have these balls of certain radii and once two points are within a certain radius of each other, they're connected and they can form a new connected component. And that connected component gets started at a certain resolution and it's destroyed at a certain resolution. And this information is recorded. So for example, you'll keep increasing the radius and you'll get different connected components. And here you've got a cycle um, and this kind of thing that continues. Um, so we were interested in this kind of resolution sweeping, but we didn't want to do it in the ambient space for the reason that I saw, I, I, told, I showed you before, that the ambient measurement space isn't necessarily giving you the right kinds of metrics. Um, and so uh, we started to develop topologically inspired methods that are based on diffusion geometry. 
Um, and this was first published in an IEEE big data paper. Um, and then um, subsequently we have other uh, works that use this method um, that are finding different, different kinds of um, structure in, in the data. So the main idea here is um, what we do is once we have a diffusion operator, you have this idea that different points um, have different diffusion probabilities to other points. So we take all the features of the data in the ambient space and we smooth them out or collapse them using that operator uh, for weighted averaging. And the weighted averaging in the vertex space is also called low pass filtering if you look at the graph spectral space. If you look at graph spectral theory, the eigenvectors of something like a diffusion map or a Laplacian eigenmap, similar things, uh, are frequency spectra. And when you smooth, you low pass filter it. So we just go through these um, low pass filtering iterations. And this kind of collapses data. Instead of re increasing the radius, you're collapsing the data. And it kind of looks a little bit like this. So here's um, this Gauss, three Gaussians that we've artificially generated. And as you go through these iterations, which we call condensation iterations, um, you're pulling the data points close to their uh, diffusion neighbors. Um, and you can do this in, in, in manifold coordinates and get them to uh, come together uh, into natural groups without forcing sort of a clustering or a hierarchical clustering. Sometimes nothing moves, sometimes things move. And when it moves tells you something about um, how persistent a grouping is, for example. And you know, of course, there's some level at which you'll see what you intuitively want to see, which is these three dots representing three clusters. At some other level, you'll see something totally meaningless, which is one dot, uh, it collapsed the whole, whole thing together. In between, you find all these other levels of granularity. And in particular, this kind of sweep of resolutions we thought would be interesting because we actually don't know what the level of granularity we're looking at when we're looking at data that can be important to predict a disease or something. Um, so um, we started to look at this um, maybe almost accidentally on a whole bunch of kinds of neuroscience data. So this is single cell data from our collaborator, Brian Hafler's lab. And so we started looking at this data, which is um, cells from retina. So these are retinal bipolar cells and associated immune cells that are there. And there were patients with age-related macular degeneration. And he was really, um, he's also an ophthalmologist and he was studying uh, age-related macular degeneration. And we, when we um, start performing these condensations, we're seeing these at different levels of granularity that's sort of different from the standard levels of granularity because it seems like in biology things are categorized and they're categorized at some level of granularity. So it's like amacrine, bipolar, you know, cones. And these are maybe not the levels of granularity at which the differences are emerging. Um, so there was another project where we were looking at this in neural connectomics. And this was really interesting because there's only 200 neurons in this worm that we were looking at. You might think you know everything about the neuron, but it turns out that people had certain circuits that they had mapped. But when you do this condensation process, you see uh, what neurons closely associated with these prescribed circuits and that they're probably missing several components of the circuit. And our neuroscience collaborator, who's, who's really amazing, Danielle colon Ramon studied these and um, wrote a paper on some of the modules we, we picked out alongside him, and which is now going to appear in Nature. So uh, we we're excited to see that. Um, so um, using the, so we wanted to pick out levels of granularity using the diffusion topology framework. So one way you can do that is you can look to see which of your clusters are most persistent across the iterations. Um, that's one of the ways. Another way I'll show in a second. So, so here when we did all of those uh, and we're looking, we can find all of the cell types that they prescribe. But we can also find other cell types that are uh, very persistent. And um, these actually corresponded to uh, subtypes of some of the immune cell types, microglion astrocytes. And in particular, activated astrotype uh, signatures that became prevalent to us in the subgroups that seemed the most different between the normal patients and the diseased patients. 
So there was this, what we started to call activated microglial state that we could identify on the basis of the genes that are highly expressed. So this is kind of the fold change versus the mean expression and the genes that kind of pop out here um, form a signature of a certain cell type that hasn't necessarily been described in detail in the people who know what microglia are. And so we checked this kind of signature um, in other neurodegenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis um, and uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we actually found that this particular cell type is actually commonly enriched in all three of these diseases. And we found, and we there are other specific populations that aren't. Um, and we found something similar for the uh, astrocyte subpopulation that we see. And we saw that they're in particular enriched in early neurodegenerative disease and not as prevalent in the later disease. So this is something that somebody could potentially look for early in the disease as kind of a, a predictive marker. And our collaborators were able to validate this in the retinal tissue by staining for them and finding them. And this, the, for, the reason they found them in dry is it turns out AMD goes through a dry phase and then a wet phase and the dry phase is the earlier phase. So um, we're, we're excited. We don't know if it'll you know, really work as a clinical marker for various reasons, but um, for the moment we've uh, submitted this paper, we'll see what happens then. Uh, but here is another way to actually find the meaningful populations that are uh, useful. And this is a technique that we've uh, been developing that's gonna appear soon in Nature Biotechnology called a um, MELD. MELD also uses these, these kinds of data geometries, um, you know, defined by uh, graphs on data in order to understand which cell types are different. So it's kind of a compositional analysis and it's a compositional analysis that's respecting sort of the continuous data manifold. Um, so the setup here is you have two conditions. It could be healthy and diseased. It could be um, sampled from a particular experimental condition. The abstract idea is you have single cell data sets that often have a lot of overlap and you wanna study where the differences are and you wanna get a hold of these differences. Um, so the kind of traditional way of doing this is to chop the data up into different clusters and study the fold change in the clusters. But we don't think this necessarily works because the truly affected cells might be spread out throughout the manifold and they might not conform to the same shape as your clusters. So what we wanna do instead is we wanna develop um, a signal as we call it uh, with, with our EE background on the data manifold that um, really mimics the way that the experiment is affecting. And then we want to use this signal to maybe later cluster so that we can find things that are more meaningful and at the resolution of the experiment. And so the way we perform this density estimation uh, is using graph filtering. So the main idea here is we take the two samples, combine them, and we make a combined graph. Uh, in the combined graph, you actually have a label already for whether the cell came from condition zero or condition one. Okay, and then uh, we turn this into a density estimate. Um, so this is an indicator signal associated with the uh, control and treatment. So these are inverses of each other and you can create a density estimate. You can think of many ways you might wanna create a density estimate. You can look at the, you know, you can average your near neighbors and come up with a probability, but it actually turns out that uh, our low pass filtering idea that I showed you before can actually create a very good density estimate if you control the filter in the correct way. It can form a density estimate that's pretty forgiving of how slowly or quickly changing uh, the data is. So in order to come up with a low pass filtering system like this, we set up an optimization where uh, what you actually want is you want a new signal. You want a new signal that's a smoothed or kind of average version of the old signal and you want it to respect the old signal too. So this part is a reconstruction and this part is a Laplacian smoothing uh, regularization and the Laplacian is the degree minus the adjacency or the Markov affinity matrix. So the idea of low pass filtering 
is again that if you look at this in the graph frequency domain, you take this signal, you load it to the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian, that it's going to load to the low frequency eigenvectors versus the high frequency eigenvectors. So uh, when you actually solve this, you can actually solve this analytically. You get a form of a high pass filter that's actually respecting like the resolution in the data based on this reconstruction penalty. And we show in the paper that this is a proper density estimate. And once we have the two different density estimates, what we do is we come up with a relative likelihood. So what we're saying is um, how likely is this cell to come from the stimulated condition or the unstimulated condition, whereas we estimated the density of the, each of these in the stimulated and unstimulated conditions. So one, so that creates this likelihood signal. I think we're calling it the treatment associated relative likelihood. And this is very helpful for us. It can help us pick out regions of the manifold that are enriched. Um, and here's an example. Here's a T cell stimulation experiment done in single cell. There were these beads that stimulated these T cells. As expected, the single cell data has a lot of overlap. So it's not really clear what's different um, or it's confusing to describe what's different. So, um, we perform MELD, which involves the graph and the density computation and the likelihood. And you get this likelihood signal that looks like this. Uh, sometimes we call it the experimental signal. Um, and this experimental signal is showing um, purple areas, which are enriched in control. And it's showing yellow areas, which are enriched in the experimental condition and some areas in between. And what it turns out is some of the areas in between, you can actually study their frequency spectrum like this. And if the speed frequency spectrum is high, these are the areas that are not affected by the experiment because it's very high frequency. Uh, high frequency areas are, are areas that are completely unaffected by the experiment. Low frequency areas are going through a transition and constant areas are interesting. And we use this method called vertex frequency clustering that uh, we develop to go along with this to identify areas that we think are uh, activated, uh, naive, or intermediate. And one of the um, things we show in the paper is that if you take these and you run differential expression between these clusters and the rest of them, you actually get things that are much more related to T cell signaling than otherwise. Uh, than if you just ran clustering without this this information. Um, so this so this is one way of understanding what cells are different. So uh, let's say you really want to match these with particular clusters, but you're not really looking so detailed at the frequency profile. Then we actually showed here that you can use it with the previous approach uh, that I said, the diffusion condensation approach and then find clusters of certain you know, salient, persistent clusters of certain resolution that are uh, enriched in particular diseases. So, um, so this is work on COVID that we did together with Akiko Iwasaki, who's a well-known immunologist from Yale. Um, and here, what we did was um, we used the diffusion condensation together with FATE to come up with a visualization that's showing different levels of granularity so that it would be easy for biologists to understand what level of resolution they need to extract uh, features from their data. So just as between FATE and multi-scale FATE, as we're calling it, uh, you have these different cell types, PBMCs visualized with FATE. In multi-scale FATE, uh, you can get a summarization of this data and you get these natural clusters out as things condense. So you can zoom in here, and this makes you go down that condensation tree and you see extra uh, structure here. And you can keep zooming in. But it's not just that you can zoom in. You can actually zoom in uh, to a level where uh, the likelihood that cells from the whole cluster are in an enriched, uh, are enriched in a diseased patient is very high. And I'll show you an example of that. So here we're looking at these 219 patients from Yale New Haven Hospital that were measured in flow cytometry along these four panels, part of the COVID impact project. So now here's MELD and multi-scale FATE together. So here you see that um, you have a certain area uh, and bunches of cells that seem enriched in patients uh, who have a high mortality score. That means they're very likely 
to die or go into hospice. These kinds of cells are more prevalent in patients that have a low mortality score. But the idea is that you can zoom in and you can find more resolution there. And at certain levels of resolution, you'll get higher, more differentiated MELD scores than this. And then you'll see what are the clusters that are subtypes that are most responsible uh, for your uh, adverse prediction. And this way you can actually pick out very interesting, uh, hard to find features from your single cell data that can be predictive of disease. And then you can look in those specific cell types for things like biomarkers, which we're doing with mutual information here. Here's another example. It turns out that if you just count the number of T cells, higher T cells is better. Uh, everybody says this in every paper. If you have more T cells, you're, you'll do better with COVID. It's not actually totally true. Uh, it depends on what kind of T cells you have. So you can zoom into the T cells. And this is just a graphical way of showing what the MELD score is in the zoomed in clusters you're getting. It turns out that if you have IL-17 positive, interferon positive, granzyme B positive T cells, that you'll probably do quite badly. And the more of those you have, the worse you'll, you'll do. Um, and this is kind of what we mean by coming up with more specific features that are more predictive. You actually train the classifier off of these kinds of features that we pick out with MELD and the multi-resolution analysis that can tell us uh, what's going on uh, with these. And our classifier was around 90% effective, definitely more, more effective than standard um, immunologically defined populations. And finally, we are interested in combining all of these different patient samples. So we took these uh, features that we derived along with some clinical features. And once again, we're embedding it with fate. So now what you're seeing is each dot is a patient rather than a cell. So, but each of those, those patients with themselves measured in single cell. So underlying that is a whole single cell data set. So you see that these patients have this kind of uh, easy to understand structure. These patients do really well, and these patients do badly, and patients in the middle do somewhere else. And then now at this level, you do get the, some of the things reported, like you know, more T cells is good, almost almost straight. Um, and this is this is one way of summarizing uh, the samples you get on the patients into the patients, while still be able to take all those features into account. And, and, and classify uh, pretty well. So um, this is sort of an ongoing study. We're still studying things, things about this method, but this is also, we've put this out on bioarchive in case you're interested in using this multi-resolution version of FATE or, or MELD. And the last thing that I briefly wanted to mention, I know I've gone quite long, um, is just about learning dynamics. So when we talked about MELD, and I talked about looking at multiple people's data sets using FATE and MELD. It seemed like the cellular populations really overlap like this, but they're slightly different, or they're slightly differently enriched. And then you can analyze that. But uh, somebody, Laura, I think asked me a different question. She said, what if the whole population is completely different? And this does happen um, if you, um, take, for example, the embryoid body differentiation, you saw the whole cellular population started getting shifted. Um, and so this is indicative of ongoing dynamics in the data. And um, here you have spots where, you know, um, where you really have a transport between these different population, populations. And so we're, uh, we were trying to understand how uh, populations over time uh, dynamically change and are transported from one to another, whereas we normally have static snapshots. And it doesn't have to be over time. It could be over disease progression or something else. And now one of the neuroscientists we're working with is interested in how brain state activation changes as people are trained to do something like control an avatar on a, on a game console. So here we're looking at how the whole manifold is, is changing or, or being uh, transported. Um, and when some of the things we want to answer are what are the intermediate states that we didn't measure? And also uh, what would happen if we extrapolated it out? Um, so what we're using for this 
is actually a very advanced form of something you guys might be familiar with, which is which are normalized flows. Usually, the way normalized flows are described is you begin with a simple distribution, and you're creating a generative model by applying invertible transformations, and you use a change of variables to calculate the uh, probability, and then you just reverse the flow to to generate samples from your simple distribution to your complicated distribution. Um, recently, in machine in deep learning, uh, there has been a trend to do this deeply, like so to create deep neural networks that have many layers of normalizing flows. And then most exciting, a couple of years ago, the best paper award at NeurIPS went to this paper that, uh, that proposed the neural ODE, which does this continuously. So it's as if the neural network had I don't know, infinitely many layers and it's just continuously transporting. It was, it's a very cool idea. So we tried to look at this um, and the way the, the way the paper works is that it's just a neural network that learns an ordinary differential equation and it could be any ordinary differential equations. But what we had was like a, something a little bit more specific. So uh, we sought to implement a continuous normalizing flow here. The continuous normalizing flows actually, I don't think uh, mimics biology because it's just giving some flow. Whereas what we think more closely mimics biology is something like an efficient or an optimal flow between the two so that you don't have circuitous paths. So we found ways of regularizing this. So you can kind of think of this as kind of straightening the paths, but not so straight as here so that you're not interpolating. Um, and the way we did that was because the neural ODE, what it's actually doing is it's learning a derivative parameterized by a neural network. And then you use an ODE solver rather than the normal SGD framework to optimize it. So we, we just penalize the magnitude of the derivative so that we're basically penalizing it from you know, changing too much and that makes your path lengths small. So uh, we could prove that this kind of regularization actually results in dynamic optimal transport. So dynamic optimal transport has been uh, described in this paper and others as a kind of optimal transport where you actually care about the path lengths uh, as well. Um, and also you have to end up in the right place. And so uh, regularized continuous normalizing flows actually mimic this uh, because you, you can give a penalty for not matching the final distribution. So you have a penalty for not matching the final distribution and you're penalizing the length of the flow. So it approximates a dynamic optimal transport. So here's an example. So you have a source and you're gonna flow this to this target. So how do you efficiently flow this circle into this S? Basically, you take the dots and you place them where they're going to go on the S immediately. Uh, as opposed to continuous normalizing flow, where you can have a lot of movement along the S, that's all wasteful, right? It's wasteful energy to flow along the S. So when we regularize with our, what we call our energy regularization, we start to get something that more resembles this than this. So, but it's still an approximation. You see it still has some, some components that are flowing. So the higher you penalize that, the more you get something that's strictly dynamic optimal transport. So dynamic optimal, uh, our network that we call trajectory net can already be used to infer certain continuous trajectories. But we noticed that in cellular systems, there's more kinds of information available that might be true of other systems too. One kind of information that's available um, besides the time points that we have uh, is actually this idea that things aren't just transporting, they're also dying or being born. So this is a factor that we've put in. Um, so we um, change it to do an unbalanced optimal transport. So we have separate neural networks that learn these growth and death rates so that you have unbalanced optimal transport. Um, and another thing we're doing is that we wanna uh, discover the flow through the data and not sort of across the data. Um, so again, we want to use our manifold learning as a penalty to guide. So what we do here is we actually use a density uh, regularization that the flow has to go through areas of density as much as it can. 
And the final type, which I actually think is available on many data types is a velocity regularization. If you have instantaneous velocity that you can kind of measure, like you can, maybe you have patients and you measure them immediately. Like you, you know what's happening to them tomorrow, but you don't know what's happening to them next month. Then you have these local arrows and you've got to respect the local arrows. Um, so we added all of these easily as regularizations, which is what motivates us to use a neural network and not some other dynamic optimal transport framework here. And then it's kind of like we reanimated the embryonic stem cells that we were talking about. And now we can get single cell trajectories and we can study um, how a cell is changing over time um, as a continuous process, which allows us to use several methods of causality analysis and things like that that are not necessarily available if you have two or three time points. So um, these are some of the projects going on in my lab. I hope you um, get an overview of it. Uh, there's a lot of others that I didn't talk about. Um, if you're interested in uh, cross-modal data integration, uh, certain kinds of nonlinear factor analysis, uh, or massive multi-processing uh, cell types. Um, one of your students also mentioned that they were interested, very interested in topology on fMRI. So all of these kinds of data sets um, are available. Um, and usually we have all our software available on GitHub. We often have data sets or notebooks available there too. If you need help using any of it, you can go to my website slash get help and it'll take you to a Slack where you can chat with us about these methods. And, um, and we always announce whenever we put out these things on, on Twitter. So let me know if you have any questions, uh, or questions about anything I talked about. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we could, we could take a couple questions now or we could do our like five minute break now and come back and have like more of a discussion, whichever, I know you had something some kind of constraint. So whichever works for you. That's fine. Um, sure, you guys can take a break and I'll, I'll be back in. Okay, great. We'll be, we'll be back at, um, let's say like 434. <laughs>
Hello. I'm looking at the participants. Do you, do you do you teach classes online now or are they in person online? Yeah, we're all online right now. Um, yeah, so if if folks are back, we can open it up to um, uh, conversation or questions. There's a raised hand. I cannot see who it's from. Sorry. Um, uh, Wei Jing, do you want to ask a question? Oh yeah. Thank you for giving a great talk. So uh, I'm waging a PhD student from Stats. So uh, I have a question regarding using normalizing flow for multiple snapshots, like mm -hmm. in the last project. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, one normalizing flow will like to learn the transformation from one distribution to another. And mm -hmm. this is concern like about multiple snapshots. So do you learn like a normalizing flow model for each of them? No, actually we learn, uh, one, um, so, so the way the neural ODE based continuous normalizing flow works is you learn a high dimensionally parameterized derivative, but it's actually an instantaneous derivative. So it's kind of like a derivative that has parameters, but it's instantaneous. So to actually learn what the flow is, you just have to integrate it. Does it make sense? Okay, so actually, the, the T. So, so the um, so so the neural ODE is not doing the traditional normalizing flow. It's just learning a derivative, but you can accomplish continuous normalizing flows with that. Thanks. Hope that made sense. <laughs> so maybe I can like check the like the neural ODE paper with me. yeah. I think that'll help. Are there any other questions? I have one, but I will let I will leave room for others to ask. Okay, I will um, I will ask mine. So this is maybe just like a a basic question. So if I have a fate project projection of some data or yeah. like <laughs> applied meld to it, and then you have a new data point, can you project that into your space or is it sort of specific to the data set that you built it with um so um ge generally speaking you can extend uh the diffusion operator um to an, an additional point using a nystrom extension um but it's not so so, so you could do that you, you you extended it or you added basically a, a row and column to the diffusion operator. And then you'd have to place it again using MDS. Um, so you're placing the additional new point, um, but um, it's, it's not as flexible or easy to do as if you trained a neural network. So there are people, actually there's somebody at Michigan who trained a neural network to um, go from regular coordinates to fake coordinates. And for him, he can just put in like 100 new points and just do this, right? Whereas with a Nystrom extension, you actually have to be careful about whether the, the point like lies on one of the eigenvectors or not. I see. So if you had, if you've applied MELD and you have this um, like probability map of your, your different labels, is there a straightforward way to go from that to a predictor that you can apply to a new point if you just want to say okay now i have a new point that doesn't have a label i want to know which of these groups it's in yeah um, yeah you could you, you could do that so what we did for that was to relate it to the clusters uh in particular that condensation was giving us the diffusion condensation method um and there would be clusters that are fairly uniform in their mel label um and we're just looking to see if points would uh, have, have the those cluster features enriched. Okay. I was so, oh, go ahead. go ahead. This is Laura again. Hi. Thank you very much. I was curious when, like, when we think about doing the single cell clustering, um, 
we've done things, I think, kind of in Surat. Um, and that, mm -hmm. that thing that you showed where the, the cell types kind of explode, you know, that those clusters Disney. like that, is that, have you compared it also to the Surat? I'm not sure whether it's using the same thing or is, is so there... Surat, yeah, Surat has Disney and, and UMAP and we compare extensively to those. So as I said, those can kind of shatter the data sometimes in a way that's not preserving the structure of the data. And when it shatters, it's because it's just thinner in those regions sometimes or? Well, well it's either thinner or there's two clusters and there's nothing preserving the distance between those so they can just go anywhere right there's nothing preserving distances it's just um you can understand it as kind of repulsion and attraction it attracts a few things and it repels everything else there's actually a paper that talks about on it in terms of attraction and repulsion but the actual direct penalty that it has is only to attract fairly strongly the neighbors some kind of k neighbors that you set by setting the perplexity parameter but um so so when you um talk about Syrah, uh so, so it's very confusing to me um but Syrah is a repository that takes in a lot of different software uh packages but somehow the way they manage it, it's not clear to people for some reason. They also call some of their methods Sura. And, and, and then they have a whole bunch of methods from not them. And that whole thing is a Sura package. It's almost like they just want everybody to say, I use Sura to analyze my data or something. <laughs> and then it's like, what are you using? Like, what exactly in Sura are you using? Are you using TC or Levain or exactly. one of the couple of random methods that they call Sura? So I think you're talking about TSNI, right? Visualizing the data. I and... think it probably is. We don't. We I haven't done that directly and didn't realize the, the um, the the subtleties of of that that Surat is not Surat. Um, oh, Surat. Yeah, I, I would say in general, Surat's a repository, and they have a whole bunch of things to visualize and to cluster and stuff like that. And yeah, usually they take whatever is most popular and stick it in there. So for visualization, it's TSNI and then UMAP. For clustering, I think it's Louvain usually. So it's interesting. I'll, I'll let other people go on and then maybe come back to mm -hmm. questions. Um, so, uh, Jean, the thing I was going to say is I might have confused you when I said point. I meant sample. So if there's a patient sample with a bunch of new data and you want to see where the how to classify that patient if they're going to have adverse outcome, um, then we've picked the features out already or, or kind of characterize the features and then you can just um, see what so you can just kind of see what um, that whether they're in their cells they have a high amount of these right so you have to go from meld to using meld to derive some new predictive features and then using those new features to predict you can't go straight from meld to a prediction for a new sample that's but, right. Okay, gotcha. Um, anyone else? Hey, yeah, sorry, I had to step away um, mm -hmm. for a little while. Uh, yes, yeah, so I actually had a quick question um, about the uh, diffusion topology um, that you described. Um, so you had the slide where it was like a continuous sweep, and then you had um, based on diffusion probabilities. Um, sorry. Uh, so you had them sort of like merge into each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that you know you'd use like zero, look at zero dimensional homology for that, and look at the persistence of those connected components. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, did. Has there been an application, maybe that one, where you actually looked at uh, like one dimensional features? And yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we're trying to do that right now. We're trying to analyze the higher, and, and also there's multivariate homology going on there because there's the iteration of the condensation, which we're taking as the filtration. But on top of that, you could also take a diffusion parameter like T, 
as another filtration. And mm -hmm. you could also use your regular epsilon filtration that you use in like Vitoris or its complexes. Yeah, because yeah, actually you're right, because you can actually do like a Viatoris Rips complex of Yeah. Like of it itself while it's happening, right? Yeah, yeah of each yeah. each thing. Yeah. So it's actually there's like a multivariate thing going on. Uh, and we're trying to see how to how to do that. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, I don't know what the like interpretation would be in that, you know. Oh, of the higher dimensional ones. Um I'm trying to think. Um, so, so you you could have, uh, yeah, I don't know biologically, I think it would depend on the system. Um, what is the interpretation of a higher dimensional feature there? I mean, you can have like constructions where you have certain kinds of almost cyclical objects where, you know, there's a change and then the cells revert back. That kind of, there could be a process like, like cell cycle or something if it's predominant. I mean, cell cycle is usually too too frequent for that resolution, but something like that. Um, yeah, no, that that's it's a really cool idea, though. I, I didn't know I don't know much about diffusion geometry until mm -hmm. you know like what you've shown, but I think that's a really neat way to combine the two. Um, the other quick uh, question I had: um, so you use a lot of interesting uh, like spatial techniques or techniques that leverage spatial information in your data and like spatial structure um, based on whatever metric you're using. Um, so one thing I've found is that when you're getting, when you're extracting features, you know, that are either topological or geometric in nature, the main thing that people want, right, is to validate what you're finding and mm -hmm. either associate it with something external to your data set, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, you, you um, predicted age with those one topological descriptors, or, you know, it's related to, you're able to show it, it covariates with this task. Um, what I think sometimes I think about though, uh, what if, you know, the feature is just existing as it is, and you can't relate it to mm -hmm. some external thing, but if you looked across a ton of data sets, it would keep popping up, right? Like maybe it's just some salient feature of, of whatever you're studying. And it's like, you know, when do you think to throw out a, a technique when you're not ex externally validating it, but you think it might be uncovering some structure that no one's uncovered? Oh, yeah. I mean, so that, that can that can happen, right? Um, usually it's not usually not a matter of throwing out the technique so much as like playing playing with the parameters and things like that. But um, I think there's often a lot of things that we get that aren't necessarily explainable. So the idea is, you know, you get a whole bunch of structure when you look at something like a fate plot or something. But the fact that I can tell some of the branches are things people have described, like neural different kinds of neural progenitors is kind of a sanity check. And it might either be an artifact. So some of the structures you see are, are kind of artifacts of the measurement. Like people would talk initially about how if they clustered their cells, they'd get one cell cluster that looks like a huge mix because that those are like the doublets or something like that or some kind of experimental artifact. So you might be picking up on an artifact so you can look at the measurement techniques and things like that. Or it could just be that you you haven't measured whatever distinguishes it, but Usually that's not the case because you're creating those from some kind of feature set to begin with. So you know there's a difference in a feature. Um, you know, what that means downstream, you might not know. It's not, not usually that you haven't like measured that, you might just not know the significance of that. Okay. Yeah, because I don't know, I think sometimes like these external validation, you know, like people have issues with p-values, which, you know, some people use them wrong, but even like, you know, showing that it predicts a certain clinical feature well, like if you tested it out, tested um, some descriptor to predict 30 different features and one of them ended up predicting well, like, you know, it, it was that just by chance? Is that just an artifact? I, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I think it's impossible to validate sort of all the aspects of it that you'd want validated. So, you know, you would validate reasonably based on what you had. So. 
Yeah, or, or I guess just saying, like, I wish there were looser reins on some of these. Cool so things. I actually don't, in order to prove my computational methods, I actually don't rely that much on external validation in a sense. It's cool to show it, or it's cool to say, oh, this predicts some biological or clinical feature. Usually what I do is, is simpler. I just create ground truth data sets, and mm -hmm. I say it's showing... Like like for fate, right? I was showing you that artificial tree, and I was showing you the fate embedding was recapitulating the branches in that tree, right? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of validation. It's usually computational validation. But there, but usually, if you find a biological feature, you can. But there's so much that's not known in biology. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, if that's uh, if there's no more questions, we can wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a thank you uh, really uh, interesting talk, very dense. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's nice to have a lot of material for different different folks with different interests. Different so. interests, yeah, yeah. Um, and thanks for the great questions and conversations throughout. Thank you. Bye. All right. Take care.